So it's a big crowd this evening, so please know if you want to get the best seats, come early. And uh, today uh, there was a request for a talk from uh, Hungary. Because these talks, they go out on the internet and many people listen to these talks and value them. So uh, the correspondent here asked a very great question and this is going to be the subject of this evening's talk. Why is it sometimes it is so easy to be impatient, neglecting, rude, maybe even cruel to those we love and are close to? And why is it sometimes so hard to be kind to them? <laughs> and of course, I think you all know sometimes how true that is. And why it is that sometimes, especially in a marriage or rather close relationship, that sometimes you can tell how long a person's been married by how they talk to each other. <laughs> and why it is that when people first get married they've got some very wonderful speech and wonderful uh, relationship, but after a while somehow or other it deteriorates and we end up bickering and sniping and being impatient, intolerant and cruel to each other. And that's not just only with, other, uh, with our spouse, but sometimes with our children, with our parents. And that's of course something which causes a huge amount of problems you know, in your life. I should mention it's also to the people you work with as well. So it causes so much pain that surely there must be solutions, and there are, and so today we're going to talk about those solutions. Of course it doesn't apply to those people who have been coming here for many years because being a Buddhist meditator for many years you always speak kindly and you've learned just how to be patient and tolerant, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but it is an important point. And of course it's something which is relevant to myself and well, A. Kagato as well, the monk sitting next to me. Because we also live in like a family, in a community of monks together. And one thing which I have noticed, that when a person first comes to a monastery, when they have visitors, or we call them anagara because these are postulants, people preparing to become monks, that they still have those bad habits of speech, but as the training progresses, the habits of speech and the way we look at each other actually change. And when you see the sort of the senior monks uh, and the senior nuns, they've been living with each other for such a long time, but they don't have that speech of putting each other down and bickering and being impatient with one another. It's a much kinder lifestyle which we uh, express towards one another. And that's very impressive to see. Because what's the point of like being a monk and like being in a community when we don't learn just how to get on with each other and also speak kindly to each other, but that doesn't always work. Because there are cases even in the time of the Buddha when the communities of monks had arguments, but there is ways of solving those arguments and there's ways of making sure those arguments don't happen in the first place. But what is the cause? There's a of those sort of bickering and being unkind to one another in a relationship. You know how much, first of all, how terrible it is and just how unpleasant it is to be with someone and you like them, you love them, but you just get into this bad habit of talking to them in a really rotten way or just behaving in a very unkind and intolerant way. You realize it's the problem and that's obviously the first step to realize it's a problem. How is it solved? Let's go back to the cause of these things. It's, you know, it's all coming from sort of a delusion, a stupidity and as far as Buddhism is concerned that's always just a major problem with life is just the stupidity, not seeing it clearly. And one of the things we don't see really clearly is you know, this our idea of ourselves, our ego, our sense of conceit. And of course those of you who know your Buddhism know that that sort of uh, sense of ego and sense of self is something which is central uh, to the Buddhist path, which is seeing you know, the idea of no self, no ego, no conceit, to see yourself like disappearing. And you've all sort of, uh, at least some of you, have seen that's a central part of Buddhism, which is absent from many other sort of uh, teachings, the idea of a no self. And part of that, part of the idea of non self, is to be able to lessen your ego so much that it doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong, who's the best, who's the worst. 
And when you don't worry so much about who's right and who's wrong, who's the best and who's the worst, it doesn't really mean that you can have many arguments because so many of those arguments are all about who's right and who's wrong. And it doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, as a monk, it doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong. As I mentioned last week in the talk about truth, what is really important is just how kind, how peaceful and how loving you can be. That's more important than being right. And wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if more people understood and accepted that? We would not only have hardly any arguments, we would have no wars and we would have a bit of peace between nations, races and religions. Who has got the best religion? And if you start talking like that, then anyone who talks like that doesn't understand what religion is. And if religion talks about love and peace and kindness, then the idea of best and worst doesn't even make any sense at all to me. And an example of that, this is one of those key stories which I know that many of you have heard before. But I like telling these old stories. In the same way if you listen on the radio, you probably hear just these old tracks of music which you heard years and years ago. It's called Golden Oldies. And here's another one of those Golden Oldies which fits in at this particular point. And it's one of my favorite stories because it gets, makes me, um, give me a chance to do some, some bird imitations. It's the great old story of the chicken in the dark. If you haven't heard this story before, this is a doozy. This is a great one. Once upon a time there was this couple who had just been married. And after going to the temple for a nice talk, it was a beautiful evening, so they went on a walk on their way back home. And as they were walking, they heard a sound. Quack, quack. Quack, quack. And straight away, sort of the, the girl, the wife said, Darling, do you hear that? That's a chicken. I'm glad you laughed because those people who laughed haven't heard the story before. <laughs> so at least some of you haven't heard the story. <laughs> That's a chicken! And he said, darling, that was not a chicken, that was a duck. And she said, no, no, I'm sure it was a chicken. I went quack quack again, you see, that's a chicken. <laughs> and he said, darling, chickens go cock-a-doodle-doo. That went quack quack, that means it's a duck, okay? She said, no, I'm sure that was a chicken. He said, it was a duck. She said, no, no, it was a chicken. He said, it was a duck. D-U-C-K, duck. And then she started to cry. She said, but, but, it's a chicken. <laughs> then it went quack, quack again. Then, he suddenly remembered what he'd heard at this temple many, many times. He squeezed her hand and said, I apologize, darling, I think you're right, it is a chicken. And she squeezed his hand back and said, thank you. And then they carried on their walk in peace and had a wonderful evening together. Now what a wise man that was. <laughs> And I do change that story around, who says it's a chicken and who says it's a duck, otherwise I get in great trouble here in Australia, I'll be gender specific and discriminatory and get into big trouble, so every now and again I change it, who says it's a chicken, now it's a girl, now it's a boy. But in that particular case, the man was smart. Why? First of all, who cares whether it's a chicken or a damn duck? Is that really important? Is that worth having a divorce over? Is that worth even actually spoiling your evening together after? That man in that particular instance of the story realized what was most important in life. Not being right, but being in love and being respectful to the person you're with. That was much more important than being right. And number two, sometimes we always think we're right and we turn out to be wrong afterwards. That could have been a chicken, 
what we call a genetically modified chicken. <laughs> Which is amazing what scientists can do these days. Make it go quack quack. <laughs> now that's true, isn't it? Sometimes we always think we're right and we turn out to be wrong. Now you can understand where these arguments come from, but in particular it's not really important to be right. It's important to be at peace. So a lot of times one of the reasons why we have these terrible arguments and speak badly to each other because we think somehow we always have to be right and that's the most important thing. And that comes from having a sense of ego and a sense of self which is just over the top. In our life sometimes we are just so encouraged to be right, whether it's at school, whether it's at work, whether it's you know, in our life, that sometimes that becomes the most important thing and that's what we build our self-esteem on, about being right. As far as Buddhism is concerned, you, you don't have to be right. You can make mistakes. And one of the great things which I learned early on as a monk, it's all right to make mistakes. It's okay to be wrong. And that was such a huge relief for me. Because for most of my early life I was thinking to be wrong is a terrible, terrible thing. It's one of the worst things you can possibly have is to be wrong. You're a fool, you're stupid, you're an ignoramus. But I realized, no, that's not being a fool, being wrong. And even the Buddha said the fool who says he's wrong, or she says he's wrong, is very wise. And when I remember reading that, it made a sort of an impression upon me. The person who says they're, they're wrong, who admits they're wrong, is very wise. Because what it's doing there is admitting you're a human being, you make mistakes, sometimes we are wrong, we don't have to be right. And that takes off a huge psychological pressure off you. You don't always have to be proving yourself and arguing your, your point of view just because you said it. And how many wonderful sort of, or how many terrible, terrible situations can we avoid when we say, yeah, I made a mistake, yeah, I'm wrong, yeah, I made a mistake. Because what that means is that you're human and there's no, nothing wrong with making a mistake. But if you do say that to your partner, say, I'm sorry darling, I made a mistake. Yes, I know you made a mistake, you stupid man. Why did I marry such a thing? You're such a fool. No, if somebody does admit they've made a mistake, Please value honesty. Because sometimes one of the reasons we don't like to admit mistakes because we think that our honesty won't be valued and that the fact we made a mistake will be considered to be more important than our honesty, that we are a failure, that we are unreliable. One of the reasons why people are dishonest in this world is because honesty is not valued. And I mean that you don't value honesty. Because if your partner came up and sort of admitted a fault, how would you behave? If they admitted a fault, they may have done something wrong or whatever, would you criticize them? Would you put them down? Would you make them feel uncomfortable or sort of punish them in this way or that way? If you do, you're not valuing honesty. So I say this in families or even in business, it's more important to value honesty more than, hard, more than most other things. To the point that if they come and admit they've made a mistake, Wonderful, you've been honest, you've been straight up because when there's that honesty you're actually respecting that person's willingness to open up and then see if we can move forward together. But when there's that lack of honesty, that lack of sharing, that lack of a vulnerable person who's made a mistake being respected, yes you have made a mistake but that's okay. Admit it, we can work together, we can do something better out of it. But when we don't admit those mistakes, usually out of fear what the other person will say, where can there be a relationship? Where can there be growth? Now this is one of the reasons why like in a monastery, a Buddhist monastery like ours in Serpentine or Gijiganup, because people are allowed to make mistakes and because their honesty is respected, they can actually open up and say, yeah I did a stupid thing, yeah I did a terrible thing. And that honesty is respected and there's no sense of their, they're demeaned by opening up to what they said. Because being right and being wrong, being perfect or being imperfect is not the point. Now how many of you are in a relationship like that where you feel you can really be honest with the person you live with and you're allowed to make mistakes to admit them 
and you're respected and you're not sort of criticized. Now that's something which we're trying to encourage in our Buddhist communities. Every time when I come and talk about forgiveness, this is not just a joke. Forgiveness is holy, it's spiritual. What forgiveness means is you're acknowledging another human being, you're opening the door of your heart to them as they are, not as they should be, not the ideal person, but as they truly are. Just as you can open the door of your heart to yourself as you are. There's a lot of growth comes from that degree of what we call unconditional love acceptance. Because from that, then there can be growth. There can be a moving forward. Whenever there's fear, whenever there's a, a lack of openness because of that fear, because you're afraid to say to your partner you know, what the truth is, or admit you made a mistake, then we always have to be right. And because we have to be right, we'll defend ourselves when we have to be right, even when we know we're wrong. And that causes all oh, this terrible sense of ego. Most of the sense of ego comes from a sense of fear. You know, the fear that you build up this, this idea of yourself because you're afraid of what other people might say about you. You're afraid of being imperfect. You're afraid of making mistakes. But it should be pretty obvious to everybody that no one in this whole world is perfect. We do all make mistakes. I've made heaps of mistakes. One of my famous mistakes was, oh, this is just so embarrassing, but oh, there was this one case many years ago in our monastery down at Serpentine. You know, I was the abbot. I'd only just taken over from the previous uh, monk, Ajahn Jakra, so and I was trying to do the best thing and trying to make sure our monks were really trained. And for those of you who don't know, just the way that the monastery is supported, you know, we don't have any cash as monks, but people offer the things which we need, whether it's robes, whether it's, you know, glass of water or glasses for my eyes, or whether it's the tools to build a monastery, whether it's the bricks to build that monastery, whatever. And because everything which we have as a monk is donated. Even this robe I wear is donated. You don't buy it yourself. I really, I, I was taught to really respect everything which you are given. Even my robe, you know, I, I tore it on the aircraft a couple of weeks ago, so you don't just throw it away, you just put a patch on it. Even my bag has got heaps of patches on it. Even though you get a new one, no, no, patch it, because this comes from the generosity of all our supporters. We really want to make these things last as long as possible, out of respect. So you can imagine what I felt when I was walking through Serpentine Monastery and I saw a hammer lying in the grass, which was going rusty. Now obviously someone had left that hammer out there for quite a while because you know it had this sort of the orange rust on it. And I thought that's not acceptable. Because someone, someone had saved some money up and bought a hammer to give it to the monks to help build our monastery. So you can come there and we can live there. So I was going to give a talk that evening and so I got all the monks together and instead of giving a talk on my, uh, the subject I thought I was going to uh, talk on, I talked on looking after these things. Now all of the stuff which you are given monks comes from hard-working lay people. And not everyone is rich, and there's ordinary people. Some people are actually just on pensions and they still come and help. And you must respect those people and that generosity. And you're not allowed to leave things out in the garden to get rusty as if they're worth nothing. Yeah, I know you never bought it, but you've got to respect these things. And I was really tough on the monks. You know, not like I am now. I really laid it in the ground. Actually, the monks were all sitting dead straight. You know what it's like when you tell somebody off, sitting dead straight. And the color was you know, drained from their faces. Because I was really hammering it with the hammer. And <laughs> no, I didn't mean to say that, sorry. <laughs> and when I finished the talk, you know, okay, I gave them a hard time, but it wasn't that hard. And I really thought that one of the monks, you know, the monk responsible would put their hand up and say it was them, and no one would admit it. And that was the most disappointing thing of all. Okay, leaving the hammer, that was a bad thing, but not actually confessing and acknowledging and owning up. Now that actually really hurt me. And actually I left that hall feeling very miserable. 
that I thought that what type of monks am I living with? Or maybe did I sort of uh, shout at them too much that they sort of wouldn't admit it? It was actually only when I got out of the hall I actually understood why no monk admitted they'd left the hammer there because I suddenly remembered who had actually left the hammer out there. <laughs> it was me! <laughs> I'd left it out there a few days ago. I was immediate to come and collect it and pick it away, put it away, but I totally forgot about it. And unfortunately, it was only when I scolded everybody else that I remembered <laughs> who it was. <laughs> and I had to go back in the hall. I said, sit down again, I've got something to say. It was me <laughs> who left the hammer there. <laughs> it was very embarrassing but very good fun because it showed to even the monks said that I make mistakes as well. I do stupid things. Now, did I feel embarrassed, really embarrassed about that? No. I thought, wow, this is another story I could use on a Friday night. Because <laughs> it's true that it's a wonderful feeling that you can actually admit mistakes. And you're free and you know the other monks there, they would accept it. And they would say, yeah, you made a mistake. Fine, we all make mistakes. See if we can do something about it later on. Now that ability of not to have such a strong ego, a strong sense of self, that you don't have to admit mistakes, you don't have to be right, is an important part of having a relationship where we are kind to one another. Where we don't sort of keep saying rotten things to each other. We don't have to sort of um, defend ourselves. Because a lot of time we say rotten things to another person to put them down. And when we say putting another person down, that means we raise ourselves up. I'm better than you. And that type of relationship of conceit, who's the best? Where does that come from? I think one of the reasons where that comes from is that we live in a competitive society where competition is just so exalted, far, far above cooperation. And I mentioned this before that one day, one day I think someone's going to take me up on this suggestion or take up my suggestion. If we learn competition even when we're kids at school where we compete against our best friends you know, in the examinations at schools. I think that's a terrible thing to have. So I've suggested for a long time now that every year in school you know, when you're given an examination, you know, you're graded to see, you know, how you're going. That maybe only 60% is your personal score and 40% of your mark is averaged over the whole class to which you belong. So if the whole class does well, you do even better. But if the whole class does terribly, then you, your mark goes down as well. So somehow reward in children in their early years, cooperation. So very bright kids will feel it's in their interest to work with those kids who aren't doing so well. So they learn by reward the skills of cooperation. Because otherwise when it's just our personal score, when we go to this university or that university because of what we've done, what I've done, aren't I great? rather than how we've managed to learn to work with other people. When we re reward only competition rather than cooperation, then when we get to the point of finding a partner in life, or even working in an office, or even living in a monastery, we know how to compete. We're great competitors, but we don't know anything about cooperation. And of course, you know, in a marriage, in a relationship, in an office, we have to cooperate. Competition is important sometimes, but cooperation is just as or even more important. And of course, when we don't know how to cooperate, we don't learn those skills at school. In a marriage, in a family, again, we don't know how to cooperate at all. Which means that we have all these arguments, you know, who's right and who's wrong, who's going to wear the trousers, as they used to say, who's going to sort of uh, decide where we're going to go tonight. And that sort of, sort of argument, it just really sucks. I mean, come on, you know, you're a, a partnership, you're a family, you're a company. What does it mean a company? It means you have to work together, you have to learn how to cooperate. And when we don't know those cooperating skills, of course, no wonder we have all this terrible speech and these arguments and getting cruel to one another. 
Because a lot of times these are just strategies to try and get our own way, to beat the other person down, to accede to our wishes and demands. That's no way. So, learn how to cooperate. And what does it mean to learn how to cooperate? Again, it doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong. Monks are like this. You know, we've got sort of uh, all the different types of Buddhism around. So, which is the best Buddhism? Mahayana Buddhism, down the road in Guildford Road, the uh, Fokuan Shan, Tibetan Buddhism, the Vajrayana, and they're up in Kambasik Road and a few other places. Or oh, our Theravada, I'm not about Theravada Buddhism, which Theravada Buddhism is the best? You've got the Sri Lankans, the Burmese, the Thais, the Australians, which is the best? Which is the best, the monks or the nuns? Which is the best monastery? Gigi Ganap or, uh, or uh, Serpentine Monastery, which is the best? We don't do that in Buddhism. There's no such thing as the best or the worst. So we cooperate. And as soon as we don't judge each other or compare one another, and there's no such thing about being right or being the best, that's called conceit in Buddhism. The Buddha taught the three types of conceit. It was brilliant teaching. Some of these little teachings you remembered, they just cut across so much rubbish in life. The three types of conceit, I am better. Now we all know that that's a conceit, but you know, as a monk you say, no, that is really wrong. There's something so stupid in that, I am better. I am worse, is the second type of conceit. And that's what a lot of people, oh, I'm terrible, I'm awful, you know, that I can't meditate properly, you know, I tell rotten jokes every week, I'm terrible. But those other monks, oh, they speak much better than me. I am worse is also another conceit. And the third type of conceit, which was also just, again, when I heard this, this rocked me, because I thought, wow, I never expected this, but it made so much sense. I am the same is another type of conceit. Each one of those is measuring you against somebody else. How can you measure a person against another person? You can't like comparing apples and oranges. You can't sort of compare these people. Every one of you are totally unique. You need to be respected for who you are, no matter who that happens to be. And you've all got a place in this world. And it's wonderful you're here. Thank you for being you. And I'm not going to compare you with anybody. So, of course, we're not going to compare this type of Buddhism with that type of Buddhism, with another type of Christianity, or with Muslims, or whatever. We don't compare at all. Because we don't compare, because comparing is conceit. Better, worse, the same. And because that's been taught to me ever since I became a Buddhist, and it's still a part of me now, it means you can just go with uh, people from other types of Buddhism. You can hang about, hang out with Roger Herf, the Archbishop of St. George's Cathedral. I'm going there on Sunday evening. Uh, you can hang out with rabbis, and goodness knows who else. You can get Muslims coming to your talks in Malaysia and Indonesia. And there's no problem there at all for you. Why is that? Because you never think that I've got the best religion. If you do, you're going to bicker. And you're going to have this terrible relationship because I am better than you are. I think you've all seen what happens when people in religion say, we are the best, we are the only, there's no other way to truth, uh, freedom, nibbana, heaven, except if you come to my church and my religion. Only those who go to Nolama will ever go to heaven. <laughs> Actually, there's some truth to that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've been saying this. I said this to the Chinese Chamber of Commerce about six months ago. I gave a talk at the Chinese Chamber of Commerce in WA. And uh, somebody actually asked this question. So it didn't actually come from me. It was come from the audience. They said, because, you know, the Chinese Chamber of Commerce is all these rich Chinese business people. And, of course, you know, the rich people, you know, they're... Yeah, they're doing okay in this world, but they want to know what happens after you die. So they said, they knew in the Christian Bible, it does actually say that it's harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven than a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. That's actually in there. Now, a camel going through the eye of a needle, now that's a pretty tough thing to do. And actually a lot of people say, well it doesn't actually mean like a sewing needle, it was some door in Jerusalem or something, but whatever it was, everyone agrees it's a very difficult thing for a camel to fast with an eye of a needle, so it must be even more difficult for a rich person to go to Christian heaven. 
So when he asked me, he said, what do you say about that Ajahn Brahma? I said, look, we don't have that in Buddhism at all. So it's actually much, much easier for rich people to go to heaven if they're Buddhists. <laughs> and you're a lot of rich people over there, so it's quite obvious what religion you should have if you want to go to heaven. And I said, that's our marketing. <laughs> if you want to go to heaven and you're rich, come here. <laughs> of course, we also get more donations that way. But <laughs> well, that's only jokes. So, of course, that's totally untrue. It doesn't matter what religion you are, what race, what gender, what sexual orientation, it's who you are, how you act, it's your goodness, whether you earn it. You don't earn it just by belonging to some sort of group. You earn it by what you do, by what you say, by who you are, how you relate. And that's just, I'm going to quote Christianity again, by their, by their acts ye shall know them. And that was Jesus or something. So, you can actually see that we don't actually criticize or compare. When we don't criticize or compare, then we don't have this you know, saying rotten things towards our friends. And then we can have this beautiful harmony. And I, that's one thing, if I am proud of anything, proud of just how we have created a sense of harmony between the different types of Buddhism, and the different religions, and every, anybody in this, this world. How can we work with anybody? Why? It's because we don't have this strong sense of ego which says, I am better than you. Or I'm worse than you, I'm the same of you. We're not the same. Buddhism is not the same as Christianity. Not better, not worse, not the same. That's all conceit. So by getting rid of that conceit in your relationship, in your family, who is the best, who is the smartest, the wisest, the cleverest in your relationship, when you get rid of that stupidity, that illusion, it's much easier to treat the person you're with with respect, rather than thinking there's some fool, which I, you know, I must have been drunk at the time, I must have been really stupid, why did I marry that person at that time? Instead of that, we respect that person. Now I find it just fascinating in my position as a monk, because this is the way I've been trained, to look at another person and really respect them, and again, respect people in prison, respect people in all levels of society. And when you respect somebody, you have this wonderful sense of harmony with them. You have, because they know they're respected. And they treat you in a totally different way than if you are th act superior, exploiting another person or whatever. When you respect them, so they open up. They feel safe in your presence. So you don't need to have those harsh, stupid words to one another. So, as you lessen your sense of ego, and you don't sort of compete with another person, but you try to cooperate with them, and when you, you learn those skills of cooperation, and you stop judging other people, it's so easy to speak kind words to them. Enemies. What is an enemy anyway? An enemy is just a person, and you're only seeing a fraction of who they truly are. You're only remembering that part of them which really upset and hurt you. And you're not seeing the rest of them. And again, in a situation as a monk, sometimes you do talk to people who are having terrible times together. You give them sort of counselling. And it's this is, happens to me so often. You see these two people and they can't stand each other. That man is a beautiful person. You really see their wonderful qualities and that's a great girl there. I can see your beautiful qualities. How on earth can you see each other's beautiful qualities? I can see them. They can't see each other's qualities. Why? It's because they got such a got in a, such a bad habit of mind, always seeing each other's faults, and that's why they start being cruel, being impatient, and creating all this terrible, terrible speech with one another. So, the way to overcome that, already mentioned, just doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong. That's, by the way, love is more important. Cooperation, no ego, no judging the other person. When you can start to do that, you can just stand aside from them. And you can stop that judgment which is already there of negativity by questioning it. And questioning it by looking at their positive sides. 
a good method of doing this, and I'm not quite sure when I last said this, I give so many talks, when I was in Malaysia I was giving up two or three talks every day. So these are little tales which I've heard, little anecdotes which really help. So please excuse me if I told this a couple of weeks ago, I'm pretty sure I never said it last week. Actually I couldn't, yeah. But anyway, there was a story of a funeral service. At a funeral service a widow was given the eulogy for her deceased husband. And as part of her eulogy she picked up a piece of paper, an old fragment, which she said her husband had kept with him since the time he was in school. And he said every time he got upset or get angry or felt guilty he would take out this piece of paper and it would take away all of his negativity. And she said that her husband told her where this piece of paper came from. She said that once when he was at school, at high school, in his class of all boys, there was some sort of argument and it got so bad there was almost a fight going to happen in the classroom. And the teacher told everybody, ordered everybody to sit down and to take a sheet of paper out of their exercise book and with their ruler to draw a vertical line down the middle of that piece of paper. At the top of that paper to write the name of the boy in that class you hated the most, the one which really got up your nose. Put their name on the top and on the left hand side of that vertical line dividing the page, on the left hand side write why they're a pain in the butt. And they all did that very easily and willingly. When they filled the left hand side the teacher said now on the right hand side write something you respect and admire about that person. No way, miss. Write it. And it took them a long time, they had to write down something on the right hand side of that piece of paper of things they admired in that person who they were angry at. Once they filled the right hand side, the teacher said, fold it down the middle along the line. Tear it carefully along that line. I'm coming round with a waste basket to collect the left hand side all the things you hate about your enemy. As for the right hand side, the things you admire of your enemy, stand up and go and hand it to them. And the wife said, this was a piece of paper which my husband's enemy at high school handed to him. It was his name on the top and all the things his enemy admired in him. And he said, wow, if my enemy, my adversary, can think such wonderful things about me, maybe I can think wonderful things about the people I hate. Maybe I can see the other side of that vertical line, even in myself. So those of you who are having trouble with your relationship, try that method. Get a piece of paper, name of your spouse on the top, vertical line, left hand side, all the things you hate about that person, right hand, all the things you love and care about them, and hand it to them. That's the right hand side, not the left hand side. Because <laughs> <laughs> what that does, it shows it can be done. And it just breaks this mold of negativity, of always seeing the faults in that person. Because you see their faults, they show you more faults. And then that's all you see with one another. And you wonder, why on earth did I marry such a person? How can you live with such a person? How can anyone so bear such a bastard in the house? That's wrong. You're not seeing them properly. They're really nice, good people, if you could see that good part in them. But something wonderful happens when you do start seeing the nice, good part in the people you live with then they start showing you more of their goodness. If you see the bad part of them, they show you more of their badness and it's endless. So the evil in a human being and the bad part of them. But you start looking at their good parts and that's what they show you more and more and more. That's how I've worked with prisoners before, that's how you work with monks, that's how you work with you guys. Some of you guys have come up to me and say you've done some terrible things and I keep on saying very good. Very good, very good. So what the heck is this monk on about? Very good. 
what I'm doing is trying to look at your good parts. So if I can see your good parts, the things which are admirable, the wonderful part of you, then you can see that again. You don't do bad things anymore. Really basic psychology. The things which you learn as a monk with meditation but also from the great Buddha's teachings. So, if you want to stop the negativity towards the people you love, so stop looking at the reasons why you should be negative. And start looking at something you can admire about that person you're with. And in the human race, there's not one person alive on this planet who hasn't got some amazing, wonderful qualities in them. There's not one person, either alive or dead. Some people say, what about Adolf Hitler? And somebody once asked that question, so what's good about Adolf Hitler? Have a read of that book, Open the Door of Your Heart, and there you'll see a poem of a mother's, of a son's love to her mother. I forget exactly how it goes, but it's something like when your mother grows old, when her eyes are dim and her hands become very weak, when she asks you for a favour, reply in kindness. If she asks you again, reply in kindness a second time. And a third time, please help her, because the time will come, the terrible time, when your mother can ask no more. So, at every time she asks, give time to her. There was something like that, but when I read, first read that poem, I couldn't believe it was written by Adolf Hitler. Because sometimes we think some people are so bad and so evil, but every person has a beautiful side. And if we can only just see that beautiful side in another person, that'll be the side which grows. And that's how we can make a beautiful relationship with other people. What the Buddha said, and this is from the Kosambhya Sutta, if anyone wants to check up, because sometimes people say, Ajahn Brahm, what he says is okay, but what's it got to do with Buddhism? Well, I've read all those suttas in Pali, I know what the Buddha said, I know my mind, I'm a meditating monk. What the Buddha actually said in this sutta, he said, after the monks had an argument, this is in the time of the Buddha, he said, monks, you should always dwell in public and in private with thoughts of kindness towards each other. In private as well. So your partner in life, your kids, the people you work with, when they're not there, think of them with kindness. What do we mean by thinking of them with kindness? Exactly what I'm saying, think of their wonderful qualities. If they've hurt you, try and find some sort of exonerating circumstances, why they must have done that. Don't just uh, conclude and judge them as bad people. They're not bad people, there's no such thing as a bad people. They're not your, your better, your worse, they're the same. Compassion means seeing some beauty in another person, giving them the benefit of the doubt. That's what compassion truly is. Opening the door of your heart to the other person, no matter who they are. They're a human being trying to find their way in this world. Maybe they're in a difficult situation, maybe having a one hard time at home or wherever. Have compassion to them. And if you have compassion in private to them, you know, you'll find that when you actually come into their presence, you know, that compassion will be just the way you respond. Unfortunately, in private, we harbour bad thoughts to one another. And that's what we have to be very careful of. So if you want to sort of have a beautiful relationship, you know, at home, in the office, in a monastery, even when you're in private by yourself, you think of that person you live with, why you fell in love, why you decided to meet with them. You think of your kids, you think of your parents going through all the difficult times of their life. You, with compassion, you give them a break. You understand and you allow them to be as they are, knowing that they're all going through their learning experiences of life and it's not easy, it's not, uh, it, you know, you've been through those times, you've made mistakes, allow other people to make mistakes, that's compassion. And when you dwell in compassion, in private, with the people you live with, it becomes your habit. You can't resist it, just you see them and that compassion which you've built up over the days, over the hours, the days, the weeks, the months, it's just there for you. 
Because there's an old joke about this man who joined a monastery. And as he joined this monastery, it was a very strict monastery where you weren't allowed to speak at all. It's absolute silence. Except after seven years, you were allowed to say one sentence to the abbot. The idea was, so he could have some idea of your spiritual progress. So this young man joined this very strict monastery and after six years, eleven months and thirty days of absolute silence, you can imagine his excitement when the next morning he could say his first sentence to the abbot. So he decided to practice in his cell something wise, you know, to inspire his abbot. You know, something very meaningful, something you know, like one saying you find in a book. And he practiced this amazing wise saying. When, into, when he went into the abbot's room, his mind went totally blank. You know what it's like. And the words which came out was, the food in this place is terrible. Now the point was, he didn't have another chance to say a word. He'd had his sentence and he'd blown it and he felt so terrible. Now he had to wait another seven years. <laughs> so, 13 years, 11 months and 30 days, now he had his second chance to say something and this time he was more relaxed. You know, his spiritual life had you know, done something, he was more in control of himself. So he had a good night's sleep, really relaxed, rested. And then with his wise words we were supposed to say seven years ago, he went to open his mouth and again he forgot. And the words that came out he said, you make us work too hard. <laughs> Very good, said the abbot, come back in another seven years. He'd blown it the second time. And of course after twenty-one years, now he was totally at ease. And when he went into the abbot's office, he said precisely what he intended to say. His one sentence was this, can't stand this place any longer, I'm leaving. <laughs> and the abbot replied, very good because you've done nothing but complain ever since you came here. <laughs> now that's an old joke, but the reason I say it is because that joke, like most jokes, are very profound. The abbot was absolutely on the nail that on the spot, that monk had complained silently ever since he came there. Was always negative, complaining about the food, complaining about the hard work, which was meant that when he did have a chance to say, all which he planned to say, that never came up, but all that he was thinking over those years, that was what came out. In the same way, if the way you think about your partner, about the people you work with, how you think about them, that's what comes out of your mouth. Not what you want to say, because some people say, oh yeah, I shouldn't say wrong things to my husband. I'm going to say something nice tomorrow, I'm going to say something nice tomorrow, I'm going to say something nice tomorrow. But you start thinking all these terrible thoughts as usual, and of course that's what comes out, it's automatic. It comes out of your mouth before you can stop it. So the only way is actually to dwell with thoughts of kindness in private. And this is how you do that, to see the other person with compassion seeing their good qualities. And when you have the good qualities in them, it's very easy to have compassion. So this is actually how we stop that attitude. We cultivate our minds with thoughts of compassion and kindness to the people we live with. And it's so important to do that. Look, these days you can't afford divorces. They just cost too much money. I remember, actually this is a new joke I read the other day. For those of you who remember that uh, actress, Sha Sha Gabor, Zsa Zsa Gabor, you know, she was this, this gold-digging actress who married so many husbands. You know, I don't know how many times she was married, but she said she was a very good housekeeper. After every divorce she kept the house. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's too expensive to get a divorce and it's just so unpleasant to you know, just to get a partner and not being able to live with them. And of course, if you do get a divorce, you get another partner, and the same thing happens again, doesn't it? And the reason why it happens is because nothing to do with the husband, nothing to do with the wife, it's you. You don't know how to live with another person. 
You don't know how to be compassionate. There's the ego there, just always wanting to be right. There's the inability to cooperate. There's the inability to sort of just um, be kind and see the good qualities in the other person. And of course, as I say every week, the most important relationship you have in the whole world is with yourself. And I know as a fact, I don't need to read people's minds, that people have a hard time criticizing their partner, always being cruel and impatient to them, are cruel and impatient and critical to themselves. They can go to work and leave their partner at home, they can go on holiday, they can go retreat at Jhana Grove Meditation Retreat Center to get away from their husband or their wife, but they can't get away from themselves. So they go down there and have a terrible time. Why? Because they're so critical to themselves, so cruel and impatient to themselves, because the way you look at others is the way you look at yourself. So what should you do? Get a piece of paper, put your name on the top, line down the middle, all the things you hate about yourself on the left-hand side, all the things you admire about yourself on the right-hand side, cut it down the middle, throw the left-hand side in the waste bin and keep the right-hand side. All the things which you like about yourself, all your good qualities, the wonderful part of you, keep that. And every time you get sort of depressed, take it out and look at it. If you want, I will sign that to authenticate it for you. <laughs> yes, this is really you. And then you won't stop, start bickering about yourself. Then at least you'll find some peace with yourself. You'll understand what it means to open the door of your heart to yourself. Because once you start to see the beautiful qualities in yourself, then you won't have this terrible attitude to yourself, always putting yourself down, thinking that you're not good enough, thinking that there's something wrong with you. In the same way that people bicker and point out the faults in the people they live with. You won't be competing with some ideal of who you are supposed to be. You'll be cooperating with who you really are, whatever that happens to be. That degree of cooperation with you is coming at peace with yourself. You don't need to be perfect. Even in the time of the Buddha, you see all these monks and nuns, all enlightened beings, they all had their idiosyncrasies, all their, their little ways of doing things which no other monk or nun had. And by no means they were sort of externally perfect, but they come to peace with themselves. That's why they were called arahats, enlightened beings. No more anger or ill will about themselves. No more bickering, I'm stupid, I'm terrible, I shouldn't do this, I shouldn't have done that. Because it's terrible to be in a relationship like that, isn't it? But you can get divorced from your partner, but you can't get divorced from yourself. That's the only difference. So have a great relationship with yourself. In private, have thoughts of kindness towards yourself. Make peace with yourself, say kind things to yourself. You know what I say every time, every morning when I wake up in the morning, I've told you this many times, I say, good morning, we have a wonderful day. I do that, last thing I do before I fall asleep, good night me, have a beautiful sleep. See you in the morning. <laughs> Because I have kindness towards myself, that's why I've got this great relationship towards me. Instead of saying, oh God, here I am again. Do I have to put up with me <laughs> another 24 hours? That's no way to live. So you can have thoughts of kindness towards yourself. Well, what I did as a young man, a first meditation teacher, told me, what do you do when you first got up in the morning? Go to the loo. I said, great, in the toilet, is there a mirror? Yeah, of course there is. Smile at yourself every morning. So you can't, no way. Because when I get up in the morning, you know how you feel when you first get up in the morning as a student, when you're really young? It's, you know, it's a stupid time to get up, any time before midday. <laughs> yeah, that's what a student is like. So anyway, you had to get up for examina uh, not examinations, lectures or something. So you got up, oh, look at the mirror, do I have to really smile? But my teacher said, fingers on the edge of the mouth and push up. And I did that for two whole years, every morning, wherever I was. Every time I got up in the morning, looked at myself in the mirror, and it wasn't a good sight, it wasn't a pretty sight at all, many mornings. Two fingers, push up. And I saw this young man, stupid young man, making a face. <laughs> I just laughed. Every morning I laughed at myself. For two whole years, every morning without fail. 
And of course, that did a huge amount for my spiritual progress. I mean, true. And I never took myself so seriously. So, that's what you can do. If your wife starts getting really upset, get your two fingers on the side of her mouth and push. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you may not try that. <laughs> But at least sort of look at yourself with some fun, with some, some kindness and compassion. And if you can do that, all of the impatience will just disappear. All of the criticism, the negativity towards your partner and towards yourself. You have some peace and happiness in life. You have some harmony, just the same way you can have harmony between all the different religions. You can have harmony between all the different races, or harmony between all the different sexual orientations without changing anybody. By allowing people to be, allow you to be. And all that negativity and all that cause for cruelty and suicide bombs which husband throws at wife and wife throws at husband. All that sort of negativity, I'm talking the suicide bombs hurled from the mouth. Those sorts of stuff, you know, we don't have anymore. You have some peace and harmony and a lot of suffering will disappear in life and you'll be happy, I'll be happy. The only people who will be unhappy is the divorce lawyers. They'll be out of a job, but fair enough. <laughs> so that's answering the question, I hope, which was sent from Hungary. Why is it sometimes so easy to be impatient, neglecting, rude, maybe even cruel to those we love or are close to us? Why is it sometimes so hard to be kind to them? Hopefully it's not hard anymore. Now you know how to do it. We can have some more peace and harmony in our world. So may you all be at peace and harmony with each other, and most importantly with yourself. Thank you for listening. Okay, anyone got any complaints about that? Was that the most stupid talk you've ever heard in your whole life? <laughs> I don't mind, you can, it's not going to harm me. Anyway, any comments or questions about that talk this evening? Going. Oh yeah, yeah, go on. Is a self different from the ego? Being kind to yourself is actually letting yourself be. When you let yourself be, it means you're not controlling. You find that people who control get the biggest egos. Control is what builds up the ego, the sense of self. Control is also part of fear. You know that people use fear to try and control each other. Governments use fear to try and control the population. So fear causes control, control causes strong sense of ego. So the biggest egos I've ever seen is the ones who really like controlling others. And I've seen some pretty big egos in my life. <laughs> I don't mind saying this, but personally, I met John Howard a couple of times when he was Prime Minister, at the end of his career, and the impression I got that you know, he owns Australia. He was Australia, very big ego, at the end of his career. I don't know what he's like now, maybe he's not Prime Minister, doesn't feel he has to do that anymore. Sometimes you met other sort of very famous leaders and I think they had this incredible sense of controlling of other people. Huge egos. But people who start to disappear, now people like sort of like an Ajahn Chah, there was no ego there. So he wasn't trying to control, just love you. Remember this great monk, Ajahn Tate, who I went to go and see. And he was just, just to let you be. Even though he was a great monk, wasn't controlling you, wasn't telling you how to meditate, what to do, no judging you at all. And that was one of those occasions which you know, hopefully you all have when you go in the presence of a great being and you never want to leave. At last there's a person there who will never criticize me. Even if I do the most stupid, idiotic things, you know, he won't criticize me at all. It's love which is totally unconditional. When you're in such a, an aura from a being who just loves you totally, unconditionally, you never want to leave because it's so rare to have that sense of peace and freedom and acceptance. And that was a person with no ego. So when you let things be, Ego disappears. When you fight in control, ego gets very strong. 
as the Buddha put it, craving causes more existence, more being. Letting go of craving, being fades away. That's actually a very profound point. The strength of your ego is how much you've craved and control in your life. When you let things be, when you float around, you disappear. Okay, so thank you for that profound point to leave you on.